Hi there, and welcome to Under the Microscope, your podcast uh, spotlighting materials and nanoscience. My name is Svenja Luhmann. I'm your host for today. And with me, I have again a guest who is a scientist, and his name is Ketan Madane, and he's a PhD student working at the University of Limerick in Ireland. Welcome. How are you today? I'm very good. Thank you very much. First of all, thank you very much for having me. I feel privileged and honored to be on your podcast. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you for joining us and sharing your science and scientific journey with us. We are, I think, very exciting for your research and your research topic. I think it's a bit different, maybe. Yeah. Uh, for me, at least, I think I, I will learn a lot. So let's maybe start straight away. So can you explain your current research to us in very simple words, please? Yeah, so in very simple words, what I do is we create magic processes. So, <laughs> so magic essentially stands for uh, we develop processes that are modular, they are, which are agile, uh, which are intensified and which are continuous. So that stands for magic. Any process that we do in today's industry is batch process. So what you do is that you have a simple stir tank reactor, uh, you have a, a component A into that, and then you add component B. So that is a batch process. So, but that batch process suffers so, so many disadvantages. So we need to make this continuous process. So essentially, if there is a process that is there, we add the magic into it and we convert uh, magic processes. So that's what we do. And my research is focused on designing and developing uh, fluidic devices to facilitate this magic uh, processes. Okay. Yeah. Can I just stop you quickly sure. right there. Um, maybe you were going to say it anyway, then sorry for the interruption. Can you just give a very simple explanation of a fluidic device? Because I'm not sure if all the listeners know what it is. Simplest fluidic device that we have in any laboratory or we use it is a simple pipe. Simple okay, pipe. that was simple. <laughs> that is very simple, right? That is the simplest fluidic device that we work on. And most of the lab labs in, in, in the across the world and all the laboratories, we use a T-junction, right? We have a, a simple pipe and then we have a T-junction, a component A is going on one inlet and a second component meets at a T-junction. And then that whatever reaction or whatever process is, is taking place that will take place at the junction or maybe down the timeline, uh, down the uh, downstream of the pipe and the process completes. So that's a simple fluidic device. Okay. Thank yeah. you. This is a simple fluidic device or rather, you know, there is another device that I want to show you that this is a helical coil. It's a simple pipe, which is wrapped helically around an axis. For those listening on Spotify or the podcast or any other just audio, he Ketan actually brought some devices. So you might want to head over to the YouTube channel so you can actually see these devices. <laughs> Yes. So this, again, as I was saying that, you know, so now what we have done is that we have converted a straight pipe into a helical coil, right? Mm -hmm. This is a helical coil. So now what happens is basically once you change this uh, straight pipe into a helical coil, the entire fluid dynamics inside the device changes. And then you have a better performance in terms of, let's say, mixing or residence time or residence time distribution. So again, now, this was we were talking about pipes. So there is another version of a pipe, CFI, coil flow inverter. We call this coil flow inverter. So we have helical coil at one section, then it goes to another section, which is 90 degree. Then it goes to another section, which is again 90 degree. So this is a coil flow inverter. Okay, so yeah. it looks like a cross of a helical coil sort of. Yes, correct. So again, uh, once you go from straight pipe to helical coil to coil flow inverter, fluid mechanics entirely changes. The performance of a straight pipe is less, uh, the helical coil performs better uh, in a certain sense. And uh, the helical coil, uh, coil flow inverter uh, actually works uh, better uh, than the helical coil. So now these are simple fluidic devices to understand. Mm -hmm. There are numerous fluidic devices and there, are, there is ample amount of literature available on all the de fluidic devices that are being used for different processes. And then you have static mixers, you have microfluidics. These are also fluidic devices. But my PhD is focused on two devices. One is fluidic oscillator and uh, second is vortex diode. Mm -hmm. So fluidic oscillator, as the name suggests, uh, it actually oscillates a jet of a fluid. So the interesting thing is that the fluidic oscillator actually was never invented for the fact to, to be used for process engineering applications. 
So the fluidic de- uh, oscillator is a device that was invented in 1960s, mm-hmm. and uh, it was the the replacement of then amroic amroic transistors. So basically, in 1960s, people were actually investing a lot of time and energy to uh, generate fluidic computers. Okay, so like a, I guess not water based, but some kind of liquid instead of yes. a silicon yes. chip. Yes, correct. So after. After the invention of PN junction diode and all the semiconductor technology, this field was a little bit, um, I mean, of course, it was replaced by uh, the electronic transistors because it is very simple to even if you use a simple fl- uh, pipe uh, to uh, connections of life here and there, you can still construct a logic get out of it. But of course, you know, these devices are bulky and eventually PN junction replaced it. But this device was there and it, this device actually holds a beautiful property. It oscillates the jet of a fluid. And why not we harness this oscillatory mechanism for process engineering application? That was the question that we asked ourselves. What we do essentially is that we study all these devices for transport phenomena, which essentially means we quantify mixing in them. We quantify residence time distribution in them. We quantify to some extent, sometimes heat transfer and mixing. Now, all the processes, chemical processes or all the process engineering applications uh, involves one important thing that is mixing. Mm-hmm. So. If we have a device, we quantify these transport phenomena in these devices and then use these devices for real time applications, real applications. So, as I said, that fluidic oscillator is something, uh, as the name suggests, there is a jet of fluid that enters a confined space and it just starts oscillating by the virtue of geometry. Okay, so there is no. No, no, motor nothing. Motor or something, or motor is wrong, no, right? Nothing. But you know, there's no. Um, part that oscillates the fluid. No, it's nothing. just the, the design of the device. Yes. So essentially, um, the main part of my PhD is I am working in devices without moving parts. Okay. So you basically, you just have a device and just by shaping it in a very specific way, you influence the fluid dynamics. So it does whatever you want to do. Yes. So uh, how to, you know, just because of shape, it doesn't happen. Sometimes very interesting fluid dynamics is always at place. Now, uh, Henry Konda is one of the Romanian uh, scientists. He invented a physical phenomena, fluid dynamic phenomena called as Konda effect. It, that effect is known after his name. Mm-hmm. So what he did was, I can give you a simple example. Suppose you are actually watering your pan- plants in garden and you are ho- holding a hose pipe, right? And if mm-hmm. you try to bring your finger near the jet of that uh, water jet, that jet tries to stick to your uh, uh, thumb, mm-hmm. right? So that yeah. effect is called as Konda effect. Okay. Right. And how to harness this effect now, right? So how to harness this effect? So what happens essentially uh, in Konda effect is that if there is a jet that is coming, what happens is that jet tries to entrain fluid, surrounding fluid inside it. Because mm-hmm. it is going in this direction, it tries to entrain surrounding fluid inside, inside the jet. Yeah. If you bring a wall near it, that entrainment is restricted. Hence, the jet to balance the momentum, it uh, attach, gets attach, it, uh, attach itself to the wall. Okay, yeah. And that yes. effect is called as quanta effect. And fluidic oscillators works on quanta effect. Okay, interesting. So you built something that's, I guess, is a slightly bit more complicated than a watering hose for a garden, but we see some similarities here. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I do have a device to show you. So this is a fluidic oscillator. Okay, so which part exactly is the oscillator? So basically you have a cavity inside. Uh, you can mm-hmm. see the cavity, right? Yeah. The cavity is basically, that is where the fluid dynamics takes place. So you have this inlet. Mm-hmm. The jet comes inside this inlet. The jet travels over here. And because there are some, this uh, diverging walls over here, yeah. Jet sticks to one of the wall. Then because there are backflow limbs, you can see black flow mm-hmm. limbs. So jet sticks to one of the wall. The fluid is transferred from this backflow limb back again. It switches the jet to this direction. Again, it goes to the another black flow limb mm-hmm. and then the jet is shipped to a, a, another direction. So this is how the uh, how it works. But um, just for um, uh, you know, you are understanding clearly. I would like to show you a video. This is the geometry of fluidic oscillator. So you can see that there is an inlet uh, and, you know, that red color thing. Basically, this is a velocity control plot uh, that we generated by doing CFD simulations. Mm-hmm. So if I st- play the video, you'll come to know that jet enters the 
this thing uh, cavity you have this oscillations okay now what happens is that i'll just stop it over here so what happens is now the jet is now attached to the bottom wall what mm -hmm. happens because of it because it is attached to the bottom wall there is a, a mass flow rate takes place inside the bottom back flow limb and yeah. this mass actually tries to switch the jet to the other direction so okay it, and so this, this is how it oscillates yeah this is continuously it oscillates okay like what is the like the real time and this what happens i mean now it's the simulation that's like a few seconds but is this also how it would happen in reality or is it uh this is exactly what happens in reality okay so it's not a it's kind of a slow or this uh, um, is a slow mo video uh, yeah. so essentially you know the property of fluidic oscillator is that the oscillation jet oscillation frequency is directly proportional to the inlet flow rate so the more flow rate you um, you know put inside the oscillator the oscillation frequency goes up what frequencies are we talking about just a rough number yeah so Four. we are talking about frequencies from approximately 1 hertz to 20 hertz depending upon the flow rate mm -hmm. so you can for, for the device that i'm working on has a uh, oscillation frequency roughly from 1 uh, lpm 1 liter per minute flow rate it gives 1 hertz frequency okay Thank so, you. Um, you know, these simulations, so I, I, I was coming to this is fluidic oscillator, one device that I'm working on. Mm -hmm. And there is a second interesting device that is called as vortex diode. So vortex diode is another uh, fluid dynamic, uh, another fluidic device that has a different phenomena into it. Mm -hmm. Now, what is a vortex diode? It, uh, the name suggests it, ha it, is, it has a vortex chamber. And there is, I can show you the device again. So this is the device, it's very small. Uh -huh. So it has a tangential inlet and it has an axial outlet, mm -hmm. right? So what happens is that when uh, from the tangential inlet, the flows come inside, uh, comes inside. And because of this, um, this profile, you yeah. know, uh, the flow, uh, uh, the, uh, the highly uh, uh, spill flow gets generated in this chamber. Mm -hmm. Because it is coming from tangential inlet of this circular section, section, right? So the flow, uh, the flow gets set up, uh, uh, circular flow gets set up inside the vortex chamber. Now, what happens is that once the circular flow, the swirl, swirling flow is developed inside the vortex chamber, at the core of the vortex, the pressure drops below vapor pressure. Okay, yeah. Now, once the pressure drops below vapor pressure, uh, cavitation takes place. So cavitation essentially is phase transfer phenomena that happens, you know, at, at a certain pressure. Uh, so we use working fluid as water. So water has uh, dissolved air into it. So what happens is if you reduce the pressure, first the degassing of air takes place because water supersaturates, mm -hmm. right? And further reduction of the pressure, what, uh, ha what happens is that water tries to vaporize because we are reducing the pressure, vapor pressure. Yeah. And it generates bubbles. And these bubbles, uh, they, they are gen continuously generated and they burst downstream and because of this bursting we have shock waves generating over there yeah and these shock waves we are harnessing for multiple uh, things uh, uh, for process engineering applications okay so you basically you you generate this this vertex or this swell flow yes swelling flow and then in the center you generate bubbles basically yes okay and then you are bubbles they burst yes and through this shock waves that are generated by this you can apply for several things yes that's how it okay is. so these are two devices so what i do how do you how do i study these devices so first i i do is that i do a uh, com computational fluid dynamics approach to study flow in these devices okay so you do computer simulations yes computer <laughs> simulations <laughs> In short, yeah, computer simulations. Now we use the one of the most beautiful equations that is, has ever been. It's a million dollar problem still at Clay Mathematics Institute. So if you solve that equation, you get a million dollars. Okay. <laughs> right. So that's Navier-Stokes equation, and um, you know this Navier-Stokes is one of the beautiful equations. So actually, you know, you have a geometry, you apply boundary conditions, and you get get the flow inside a device. So mm -hmm. before even doing an experiment, we know how the flow is going to take place. So we are actually in a certain same sense time traveling in fluidic devices.
okay. <laughs> so this is getting a bit like interesting here. So we have a magic processes and time traveling. Is this a science podcast? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean, so you actually predict flow. So mm-hmm. essentially, uh, you know, uh, Navier Stoke has that capacity. In a certain sense, we are seeing future. We are time traveling in devices. We are time mm-hmm. traveling in flows, basically. So, so first, there is a geometry, and if you if you apply, you know, give some flow rate to this device, what would happen, right? Mm-hmm. Of course, these uh, these Navier Stoke equation are very simple uh, in terms that the basic law behind is just mass conservation and Newton's second law. Mm-hmm. But because of this fundamental uh, theory of mass conservation and Newton's second law, uh, we apply it to fluid flow. And we get uh, something called uh, uh, equation beautiful as beautiful as Navier Stokes, uh, which does not have an exact solution at, at till date. <laughs> and it was origin it was originated maybe in something uh, something in eighteen hundreds, and we don't have an exact solution. And if you solve uh, solve and get an exact solution, you get a million dollar. The prize <laughs> is still open. This year goal like. <laughs> <laughs> So no, uh, that's how uh, the um, uh, Navier Stokes. So basically, we solve Navier Stokes equation uh, to uh, get uh, you know predict flows in mm-hmm. these devices. And then what we do is that as we are simulating flow in these devices, we simulate along with flow. We of course we simulate mixing, we simulate uh, residence time distribution, uh, which is essential for process engineering applications. So we use powerful computer simulations. Then we optimize the geometry mm-hmm. so that we get a certain um, degree of mixing or residence time distribution or what the process, the, how to satisfy the process requirement. We do these kind of simulations. We optimize the geometry. Then mm-hmm. so we have a geometry. Now suppose, for example, there is a geometry uh, which has a mixing intensity of let's say seventy percent, and we want to raise it to hundred percent. So yeah. there, there should be some geometrical modi- modifications that we need to do. And due to these geometrical modifications, you can increase the mixing intensity. So instead of constructing and manufacturing the device, we do it through computer simulations. And once we have an optimized geometry, we uh, manufacture it and we mm-hmm. test whether it is correct or no. Okay, so in your group, you're both working on the computational side and on the actual experimental let's side. Let's say experimental side. Okay. You already showed a few fluidic devices and you talked about that it's important for a lot of processes. Can you give me like two brief examples of processes? Like, you know, why why should we care about fluidic devices? What are interesting processes? What are, I don't know, important industrial implications? Just, yeah. you know. So um, we I'm also working on the application of the devices. So my mm-hmm. application is concentrated on uh, crystallization, anti-solvent crystallization. Uh, what we do is that we do have model crystallization systems that are already in place. So suppose we have uh, we have to develop any new reactor. Uh, we already have model crystallization system that we use to test these devices. So we, uh, what I'm working on is anti-solvent crystallization of paracetamol. So Okay. And this is about how to produce paracetamol or how to make paracetamol more, I don't know, efficient in its effects in the body or... Like... So what I am focusing is on particle size distribution of paracetamol. Mm-hmm. So what happens is that you know uh, anti solvent. So we, uh, what is anti solvent crystallization? So we have a saturated solution of paracetamol in let's say methanol and water mixture. So the solution is saturated now. Mm-hmm. Now you add anti solvent into it. Anti solvent is in this case water. Mm-hmm. So you have water and methanol mixture. You saturate that solution with paracetamol, and the paracetamol mm-hmm. is completely dissolved now. Now you add water as an anti-solvent again. Yeah. So water as an anti-solvent, what it does is basically it reduces the solubility of paracetamol inside that solution. Yeah. And now paracetamol precipitates out. It crystallizes out, sorry. Yeah. Okay. And so you the, get paracetamol, paracetamol powder, essentially, powder. right? So crystals in the in this oh, case, crystal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, now the crystal size distribution of the forming paracetamol crystals depends upon how uh, depend upon the intensity of mixing. Mm-hmm. Right. So, uh, in in the in recent study, uh, we were able to show that you know uh, we compared our performance of fluidic oscillator with a stir tank reactor, mm-hmm. and we had significant reduction in particle size, because what happens is that the the more efficiently your anti solvent and solvents are mixed, the more uh, mixed it is, the more uh, nuclei will form of uh, paracetamol uh, because it is 
completely mixed i mean we can assume that it is completely mixed it's definitely not completely mixed because there is a distribution if it is 100% yeah. mixed it will be just a mono dispersed uh, particle size but uh, you know uh, so in stir we, what we did was we compared stir tank performance with fluidic oscillator and we had significant reduction in in the particle size and even uh, spread of the particle size was also reduced so we used fluidic oscillator for that okay and this reduction in particle size is good because it results in better packing performance primary packing yeah packing and even because you know particle size uh, so packing yeah basically essentially it is packing packing of the uh, you know uh, tablets and all the stuff so particle size is essentially what uh, pharmaceutical industries are looking for so that is one thing and okay. now uh, this is about fluidic oscillator right because it acts as a good mixer why mm -hmm. it is acting as a good mixer is i i i'll draw i'll just pull out another video how mixing takes place in in fluidic oscillator okay so now the same oscillator right so we have uh, i am I'm, I'm i'm not sure if you are able to look but um, if you see the inlet there are two segregated stream one is blue color and one is red color at the inlet right so we have two segregated streams of let's say one is tracer and one is water so we are injecting this tracer and water inside the fluidic oscillator and okay uh, so the red is the Paracetamol mixture and the blue is water or whatever. In the in the sense, in in simulation purposes, this is just plain water water. So how do you see okay. water and water is mixing with water? Numerically, that water is different. It's tracer, but it is numerically water. So yeah, mm -hmm. I mean you can see this animation how how this um, you know this happens. So I can start this. So see now you can see that uh, the entire um, volume of the uh, fluidic oscillator is green, which essentially means that it is fifty percent water and fifty percent tracer, which essentially means it is mixed okay so you start with you know the blue on top the red on bottom so they're completely separate and then once you're in the device everything is green so everything is completely mixed because you know there is a vortex that generates and there is a vort mm -hmm. warming of vortex and shedding of vortex and because of this uh, persistence forming and shedding of the vortex mixing takes place so this is fluidic oscillator. So we use fluidic oscillator as a good mixing device in anti-solvent crystallization to have better control over particle size distribution. Uh, we were able to prove that after a certain uh, flow rate, uh, the mixing intensity of fluidic oscillator reaches a saturation of 100%. Okay, so you can actually reach 100 You know, in a lot of processes, often you try to reach 100%, but maybe yes. it's not possible. Yes. But okay. Cool. This sounds... All very, very cool and interesting. And I guess there are a lot of super interesting applications. And I hope you will show more of your different devices and simulations yes. once you take over the Twitter account. I'm interested now. So how did you get there? How did you become a PhD student working with these fluidistic devices at the University of Limerick? Well, it's a very long story, but um, you know, I started my, I did my bachelor's from uh, as as I'm, I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I'm a bachelor's in mechanical engineering. Later on, I was working in manufacturing industry for a year. I was working in foundry uh, and machine shop. Uh, then after that, I changed that job to teaching academia. You know, I was teaching subject of mechanical engineering. After that, you know, I switched that and I opted for my masters. And it is in masters that I actually uh, found this very interesting, um, you know, I, I found a project to be done in uh, one of the research laboratories in India, uh, mm -hmm. which is a government laboratory. Uh, it is National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. So I was working with Dr. Amul Gulkarni. Uh, he, he is one of the pioneering scientists in, you know, chemical engineering and reactor design. Mm -hmm. So over there, I was doing my master's dissertation where I worked in micro reactors, micro channels, basically to, well, you know, to, um, unify flow, flow uh, unification of uh, uniform flow. I was working in uh, unifying the flows in parallel micro channels. So okay. that that uh, you know uh, that dissertation basically actually uh, grew. It actually grew my interest to pursue my research in in fluidic devices. So mm -hmm. I, over there also I was doing simulations and experimental validations of these devices. And then after my master's, I continued my research over there in uh, CSIR National Chemical Laboratory Pune, where I worked with static mixers. Impinging jet reactors, impinging jet reactors for uh, anti, uh, precipitation, anti-solvent precipitation, then uh, static mixes for um, different applications, and even uh, flow distribution. I was designing manifolds for uh, unifying flow distribution in parallel channels. 
so after that you know i was i was uh, i was very much interested and clear to do my uh, research in fluidic devices mm-hmm. when i was searching for positions uh, in the meantime i joined industry as a cfd consultant at tridental solutions pune where i was doing just simulations nothing else i was doing industrial projects like stir tanks plants and everything i mean i was doing everything that could be simulated i was simulating those things and uh, that was my profile <laughs> so after that you know my, then i got an opportunity to join um, my phd at barnal institute at university of limerick uh, my project is funded by synthesis and solid state pharmaceutical center that is sspc it is a science foundation ireland research center for pharmaceuticals mm-hmm. so i am doing my phd under professor uh, vivek ranade uh, he is another one of, one of the pioneering names in in computational fluid dynamics and chemical engineering so i work in uh, multiphase reactors and intensification group so our entire group actually uh, works uh, they work in multiphase reactors and of course intensification we try to intensify these processes by introducing different fluidic devices so that's what we do and that's that's the journey so far <laughs> okay cool so you so you worked basically in a similar field from your master's on you already have some industry experience so not just not just academic experience how has that changed like how's it to go you know from university into industry back to university is it is it very different you know working cultures or is it that is different it is definitely different i mean uh, in, in in university you have uh, uh, you know the working style in the university and academies are different so you actually uh, have very new things to do well in industry sometimes i i personally my my, my personal experience is that industrial job gets a little bit monotonous i am not saying that it is wrong but yeah sometimes it actually happens yeah it's a little bit monotonous but uh, i think research is more lively so yes okay. that's that's how it is then i then i hope that you you know can continue to have such an interesting interesting job how long have you been doing your phd now i am in final year i'm about to submit now so yeah. oh 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 okay <laughs> i'm not going to ask any more questions you know <laughs> when to when you're finished nothing about your writing we are, we are not going to talk about this it's okay <laughs> um but good luck <laughs> yeah, thank you <laughs> okay so we already had a lot about different you know fluid devices we already saw a few and you already you know what i learned have worked in in different places different countries even on on this so on this podcast we have a section which we call in other words and for this i would like you to pick just one research project and explain it to us in simple words please yeah so the whole idea of using and optimizing fluidic devices to cater to specific process requirement is little bit intriguing i mean i was i was a little bit interesting in that so so what we do is that uh, what we did basically and what i actually uh, uh, you know we, we we recently published a paper in chemical engineering journal uh, last year and we were we were able to show that um, you know using this uh, d- devices to augment stir tank reactor standard stir tank reactor to have direct control over particle size distribution of forming crystals uh, that is one of the uh, good examples of usage of fluidic devices so that is one of the research that i am you know very much uh, i i was very i am very much proud to say i mean i would use the word proud that you know this is this was the first time that anybody had augmented stir tank reactor so what we did basically was um, you know uh, we used the same model system of anti solvent crystallization methanol paracetamol and mm-hmm. initially what we did was we uh, used a stir tank reactor a standard stir tank reactor Uh, which uh, which hosted a saturated solution of methanol paracetamol and we added water as an anti solvent mm-hmm. so then uh, after the process was completed we uh, measured the particle size distribution then what we did was you know uh, we tried to uh, we we had the saturated solution inside the stir tank reactor and we pumped it out from the stir tank reactor and put it back inside the stir tank reactor so this was a closed loop so you mm-hmm. uh, you took uh, you you pump out the solution from the stir tank reactor you pump it in again and now here what we did was we we added anti solvent inside that loop outside the stir tank reactor mm-hmm. now we had a significant reduction uh, in in particle size distribution okay so just because we are adding uh, the anti solvent outside the stir tank reactor inside a t junction mm-hmm. mixing little bit enhances and because of this enhancement enhancing uh, enhancement in mixing you have redu- reduction in particle size distribution and the spread of the particle size distribution goes down 
So now over here, we use a simple T junction. Now instead of T junction, we used oscillator and diode. The mm -hmm. vortex diode and oscillator we used. So with oscillator, the particle size came down again, and with vortex diode, it came down again. Now one interesting thing that I forgot to uh, mention is that uh, you know that the vortex diode can uh, create shock waves because mm -hmm. of cavitation, the bubble because of yeah. the bubble collapse. Now, um, you know, most of the pharma industries, they use uh, to control the particle size distribution. Uh, what they do is that they use a, a wet mill or a, a, a dry mill, a milling machine, basically, just a, mm -hmm. a mill, right? So what they do is that they inject a, a solution of, uh, let's say, with particles inside and a solution, they inject into the wet mill and mm -hmm. then they mill that uh, crystals. They mill it literally. They break those crystals. Okay, yeah. Use the particle size. So now one interesting application of vortex diode is because it generates shock wave is actually uh, these shock waves can break crystals. They literally break crystals. Mm -hmm. so, so instead of the physical milling, milling you can yeah. use the uh, shock waves yes. formed in your liquids. Like, so we use that. So uh, because we used the vortex diode in that, uh, uh, that study, there was significant reduction. I mean, it was visible, I, uh, you know, visible reduction in particle size distribution. So that we were able to publish in a chemical engineering journal recently. And yeah, I mean, that is one of the research that uh, that actually cemented that, you know, these fluidic devices work. Okay, I think you're very right to be proud of this. Just because I think we haven't talked about this now. Um, can you just give me a brief like order of magnitude if we talk about particle sizes? Or particle size distributions but what is the size roughly we're talking about is it you know so uh this uh, i mean in this uh, this uh, cj paper basically you know uh, with stir tank reactor we had particle size our average mean size of particles basically was something around 150 140 microns and okay. then with just simple addition of t junction uh, that particle size reduced by 20 microns with mm -hmm. fluidic introduction of fluidic uh, oscillator, it reduced further by 20 microns. And then with our vortex diode, it further reduced with 20 microns. So we reduced from particle size from uh, 150 microns to, let's say, 100 microns, okay. uh, which is not significantly more. Uh, I mean, it's not significant reduction. Uh, but uh, one thing is that uh, use, uh, one more advantage of using fluidic device is that you have this process to be repeatable. I mean, uh, I have I I I actually uh, published this with error bars uh, in in uh, error bars over the particle size distribution with these devices. So what happens is that uh, there was there is this this research has been published long back in 90s I think 90s or 80s that where you add your anti solvent or where you add your second component inside the mm -hmm. stir tank reactor actually influence actually has different mixing. So if you add it near impeller, you add it over uh, the surface of the water, or you add somewhere inside the stir tank reactor, it changes. I'm just you cannot have a repeatable process in stir tank reactor. It's highly it's it's not that I'm not saying that it is not highly repeatable, but it is not repeatable, it is not highly repeatable. So there are a lot of error bars and the spread of the particle size distribution is too long. Okay, too, yeah. Too broad. But the usage of fluidic devices, because fluid mechanics never changes, because it's a virtue of geometry and the geometry never changes. Yeah. So you have uh, this, I mean, if you repeat the process, the error bars are too small. And even because the mixing is uh, good, the, uh, there is a, the spread of the distribution also reduces. Okay. So it's not just, you know, mean value reduction, but also the, the spread. And so the spread, yes. And reproducibility. Yes. Okay. Very cool. I think we all figured by now that you really like fluid with devices and the research you're doing on them and it sounds really cool. And but there are other aspects of being a scientist than just like, you know, doing your simulations and doing the experiments. So what other aspects do you like about being a scientist, being a PhD student? Well, certainly being a scientist, uh, I would say is incredibly fulfilling. It, it is incredibly fulfilling for several reasons. Now, first and foremost is that this endless curiosity. You have this endless curiosity of finding out new things and, you know, and this endless curiosity is some, somehow is acting as a, uh, is a driving force to carry forward research and, of course, the pursuit of knowledge. So, you know, uh, all, every day there is a new phenomena that takes place. And as you know, you know, uh, <laughs> it's oh, after, two, after 200 years, there is no solution for exact solution for any <laughs> equation. So you always have this, um, you know, I'm not saying that I'm going to because that's not that's not my area. But still, 
know, there are a lot many uh, beautiful concepts and aspects of uh, being a scientist that you always find new um, uh, phenomena, you always find new concepts, which are uh, very much interesting and it acts as a driving force. And then every day there is a chance to explore something new. So I, when I was working uh, previously in fluidic devices, I never knew that there, is a, there, is a, there was an effect called as quanta effect. And the mm-hmm. jet sticks. So harnessing yeah. that for a device and using it for processing application was definitely something new that I tried to explore, right? And then, of course, there is uh, challenging the existing idea is one of the uh, aspects of uh, being a scientist. So I, I'm not saying the stir tank reactor is a bad reactor. But uh, I would say that you know, using uh, fluidic devices with non-moving parts actually has better advantage over certain reactors mm-hmm. in certain cases, surely, uh, if not all. <laughs> and then, um, you know, in a, uh, the one thing that personally I feel being a scientist actually overhauls your, uh, um, you know, look, uh, overall perspe- perspective towards life. So the ability of how you pursue your things in real life is slightly enhanced due to uh, just... It, it just as an occupational benefit, if not hazard, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that is that is the one of the things uh, you know of being a researcher. Additionally, you know, uh, unraveling mysteries, conducting experiments, finding solution to real life problems, is brings a, a, to a certain sense it b- brings a sense of let's say accomplishment mm-hmm. uh, in, in one's life. And uh, also, you know, in on personal life front, uh, definitely science actually makes a good impact. Um, on personal life too, and uh, subsequently on a larger spectra, um, you know, to to, to pap- people and planet. So that's how it is. I mean, uh, so whether it is through enhancing perception, developing new technologies, improving healthcare, or addressing environmental challenges, you know, these mm-hmm. are all the aspects that you know. Not I am not working on every everything of this, but uh, we as a whole, as a scientific community, we are contributing in a certain way for the betterment of society, and that that's I think is the best part of being a scientist. That is very true, and I don't think I can, you know, add anything to this. You said this very nicely, so I think I would just, yeah, <laughs> shut up and leave it like this. <laughs> no, but it's I, I think it's it's great, and I, I I especially also the the point what you said resonated with me that you you know continue learning and you know there's always there's so much still to discover. It's not like we you know. Yeah. figured it all out that's definitely not true and it's yeah it's very very cool to stay stay curious and play and yeah hashtag stay curious <laughs> <laughs> okay <laughs> um yes so this sounds all very good and like you really you know enjoy being a scientist and enjoy your research but you know if nothing's perfect so if you had three wishes to improve your research experience what would they be one foremost thing that i have experienced now i've been in uh, doing my research since like let's say 2015 it's been over like eight years now one thing that i definitely want this to uh, and i think this is uh, true across every every fields bridging mechanism between interdisciplinary fields there has to be a bridge so that you know, you know, there has to be certain mechanism that we are bridging interdisciplinary fields. So, for mm-hmm. example, if I talk about fluid mechanics to a chemist, he'll not understand anything. So, you know, there are there are certain things. I'm not saying that everybody doesn't know that, but uh, you know, if your reaction, let's assume that you know, if your reaction time is less, very less, very mm-hmm. less, and your reaction, uh, your reactor's mixing time is more than that. Mm-hmm. It is not going to. I mean, that reactor has no uh, that, that that reactor has no role to play over there. So, that's you know. Also, uh, bridging these gaps of interdisciplinary fields, maybe you know, we we might to some extent uh, uh, enhance the impact of our research. Mm-hmm. So, bridging is essential. So, if there, somebody is developing a process, uh, we will uh, we try to study that process and then we try to make it continuous. But people are still stuck in in let's say the conventional process and they don't want to change. Okay. The resistance to so, change. So, chemists who are listening to this, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm sure they're going please to go back me. to the beginning of the podcast. <laughs> I can't unexpect. No joke aside. Um, I agree very much. Like I think. There, are, you know, you speak your own language in every subfield, and you have your own, you know, bunch of literature and 
it's sometimes, you know, even among fields that I, in principle, neighboring, not always so easy to to talk to each other and to get the others to to read the relevant literature and so on. Mm-hmm. So one example that I would like to give is that you know in mechanical engineering there is a there is a device called as heat exchanger, a so normal tube shell and tube type heat exchanger. Now uh, if we you we can use that shell and tube uh, type heat exchanger as a reactor too, but mm-hmm. uh, the velocities and all the tubes are constant. Uh, we maintain uh, mechanical engineers know the calculations to maintain the velocities in the in the tubes constant. But when it comes to application for this chemical engineering, we want residence time distribution to be constant. I mean, all in inside all the tubes. So this, if if we combine these two these things, uh, we can use a shell t- shell and tube type heat exchanger as a reactor too. So that is one example that I would like to mm-hmm. quote to interdisciplinary fields. Okay, uh, that, that yeah. was your first wish. Yes. What's your second one? Second is uh, I, this is a dream come true. Basically, I work in simulations. Give me a supercomputer, <laughs> personal supercomputer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I should have said this in the beginning, but uh, we actually cannot make your wishes come true. We just ask for them. <laughs> I cannot yeah. give you a supercomputer in base. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. So basically, you no know, unlimited access to cutting edge technology. So of course, the unrestricted use to um, uh, experimental tools and uh, computational tools is what uh, uh, is sometimes it is restricting uh, because, you know, uh, the amount of, um, you know, why am I saying this uh, of uh, this computers things is because sometimes you know what happens is that there is one cluster where everybody is using and sometimes the job goes goes in queue and there's a lot of time delays every here and there. So I think unrestricted use for um, for computational and experimental tools is a second wish definitely. Mm-hmm. I would like to have that uh, access to all the tools and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, very understandable. And your third wish. <laughs> I, I'm sure th- you're going to agree with the third wish. Sustainable for us, research funding and recognition. Yeah, it's, I think, like, we've asked this question a lot of people, and a lot of people say they want more money, like, yes. not for themselves, but for their research. For the so. research, yes. Last but not least, of course, money uh, matters. Yeah. <laughs> so yes, money. Uh, and then I recognition is another thing that I actually I would like to emphasize. And I love the work that uh, science talk is doing in this field. And I'm, I truly appreciate you guys because Thank you. Uh, that is not something that, you know, people do to recognize, give recognition to at least researchers. <laughs> because <laughs> unsung heroes, basically. Uh, we try our best. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so your three wishes were um, more interdisciplinary or better interdisciplinary work, um, supercomputer, and more stable research funding. Basically, all three very valid. I really hope they come true for you. Or, I mean, the first one maybe comes true for all of us or for the whole research community. I think that's a very good point that becomes more and more important and I hope we, you know, manage to get there. (laughs) Okay, Um, thank you so much. Um, Apart from this podcast, you will also have one week access to the Real Scientist Nano Twitter account i'm still saying twitter that's <laughs> everyone knows what i mean right yeah um so during this week what can the followers expect from- so what i'm planning to do for the uh, this curation week i mean when i will be the uh, handling the twitter account or the x account uh <laughs> So uh, first, I'll I know we'll introduce our group of multi-phase reactors and intensification, our philosophy, and what are the areas which we are working in, and of course, then I'll uh, write uh, all the devices that we are working on, and then of course there will be some interesting applications that will be disclosed. So how can you use these devices for um, for different applications? So we are working on let's say um, we are working on milk production, milk uh, waste valorization of ma- the, the dairy industries. We are working in on personalized emulsions, 
and then we are working on crystallization too and uh, so these are broad spectrum of applications that we we do in our group and yes uh, so what we do is that you know i will try to first introduce the group and then eventually uh, disclose few interesting things that uh, we are doing as a group and also if um, i am not sure but i will also write something something interesting in in, in fluid mechanics uh, that is my plan for for the week sounds very good and i think what I figured now is that these processes are important for so many different applications and processes that I didn't even know, you know, you would use fluidic devices for. Yeah. So very much looking forward to this. Thank you so much for speaking with me and looking forward to your week on the Twitter account as well. Yes. Thank you very much. It's, it's a pleasure. I, I cannot thank you more. Thank you very much for this opportunity again. Thank you and thanks all for listening or watching. Goodbye.